Hello, and welcome back. It's been a while. This is Reflections on Investing with the Cornell Capital Group. And today we're going to talk about an age-old issue. We're going to revisit risk and return. And for centuries, investors have said, if you want more return, you have to bear more risk. But this has kind of been an empty statement because there was no clear definition of what risk was. It wasn't until the late 1950s and early 1960s that two people, Harry Markowitz and William Sharp, were able to clearly offer a clear definition of what investment risk was so that the trade-off between risk and return could be numerically measured. In other words, it gave it some scientific basis. It was no longer just uh, investment manager speak, it was now something that could be quantified. And both those people received Nobel Prizes for their work, very well deserved Nobel Prizes. So let's talk a little bit about uh, return and risk. You can think of making an investment in something like the S&P 500, and that's where I'll focus the day, general stock market indices, as offering two components. The first is the risk-free rate. That's the time value of money. What you earn for giving up your money now to get it back in the future. The second thing is a risk premium. Uh, what do you get over and above the risk-free rate to pay you for bearing risk? And that is where Markovitz and Sharp really made their contribution. And today I'd like to focus on one output of that, which appropriately enough is called the Sharp Ratio. So the first uh, exhibit here shows the theoretical Sharp Ratio, which is the difference between the expected return on your portfolio and the risk-free rate, in other words, the risk premium on your portfolio, divided by the, st the standard deviation of the portfolio. Now, in the, theoretical, um, in the theoretical setup for this, it's the expected return and the expected standard deviation. Well, that's great for theory, but you don't know what the expected means in practice. So in practice, when the Sharpe ratio is applied, it's the average return on your portfolio over some specified period minus the average risk-free rate, divided by the average standard deviation of your portfolio over that period. Now, that's a lot of talk, so let's, let's do a specific example to make sure we're all on the same page here. So between the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2023, the average return on the S&P 500 was 11.81%. The average return on Treasury bills was 1.74%. So the risk premium, the numerator in the Sharpe ratio, is the difference between those. And the standard deviation of the returns on the S&P 500 over that four-year period was 23.01%. So you plug those numbers in, and the Sharpe ratio comes out to be 0 0.44. And what's particularly important about the Sharp ratio is Sharp's theory said no portfolio should offer a better Sharp ratio than the market portfolio. That's the theory with the expected. Now in practice, of course, some portfolios do offer better Sharp ratios than the market portfolio. For example, over this four-year period, the Magnificent Seven uh, the, the, the five giant tech stocks considered as a portfolio had a better Sharpe ratio than the market, but that's only over that four-year period. Now, the Sharpe ratio is one key way of measuring the trade-off between risk and return, but there's other interesting things you can look at. There's the so-called Sortino ratio, where the standard deviation is replaced by the standard deviation of drops. And then there's even a simpler uh, 
measure of risk, which uh, is interesting to look at. And we always look at this at the Cornell Capital Group just to give us some insight into how the market is behaving. And that is the number of drops, daily drops, greater than a given level in any particular year. Now let me show you exactly what I mean by that. In, in the, the next chart, it plots for each year from 1963 through 2024, 2024 being a partial year, how many daily drops were greater than 3% for the S&P 500. And if you look at the chart right away, something remarkable pops out. Between the beginning of 1963 and mid-1973, over a decade, there was not one drop greater than 3% in the S&P 500. Zero. Then in 73, 74, the market collapses, and you can see there's about five drops greater than 3%. Then, except for two isolated incidents, nothing happens till 1987. That's the year of the great 20% one-day crash in the market, and you can see it was associated with quite a few drops greater than 3%. Again, things get quiet largely until the dot-com bust, and then you see a bunch. Once again, quiet till the great financial crisis when there's a huge number of drops greater than 3%. Again, quiet till covid then quiet until the, 19, the 2022 post-COVID drop. And since then, since mid-2022, there's not been one. Now, I think what this chart helps you understand is that bad times seem to come in bunches, interspersed with long periods of quiet. Now, they're not actually cyclical. These, these crises just seem to arise. And the reason for pointing all this out is that most of these crises followed a period of ebullience when the market was near record highs relative to uh, cash flow or earnings. And that's where we are right now. We're in a very quiet period. There haven't been any big drops. The market price is very high relative to cash flow and earnings. You might say, well, that's all great. Well, I guess it is great. But at the Cornell Capital Group, it gives us pause. Is this a new normal, or is this a quiet before the storm when we may well see another period uh, where we have substantial number of drops over 3%? It's worth thinking about and preparing yourself. This has been Reflections on Investing with the Cornell Capital Group. Thanks for joining.